actually, um, have really appreciated her work. And I'd, I'd sort of, I know you have a variety of IDs and, and gnomes that you'd like to, to identify yourself, but I, I've come to know you through the Ohio uh, Poor People's Campaign for or Moral moral uh, Campaign, um, and also through some of your, your other ministries that you're doing. I'm starting to look at your, your, your Facebook ministry uh, that's going on uh, on the daily. So, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, share with you us what you'd like to share with us? Um, you're among friends. Please uh, speak as you'd like to. And uh, thanks for co coming on us uh, and talking to us. This is a monthly salon that we would sort of focus on local and international issues and try to tie them in uh, to how we as as a community of, of media seekers um, uh, and creators um, push that out. So thank you, uh, Reverend Susan Smith, uh, for offering to, to to give us some wisdom today. Thank you. Although I'm, I'm writing a paper, I, I just real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm writing a paper sort of about um, God never promised us wisdom and knowledge. He said mystery and abundance was, and so as soon as we sought knowledge, that's when we got kicked out of the garden. So, but anyways, <laughs> that's another theological subject. Uh, but go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I thank you for uh, inviting me. I actually had almost forgotten. I was looking through my email. I said, oh, shoot, I'm supposed to be on tonight. So um, thank you. But the whole uh, thing about uh, the thing I've been wrestling with since this is it feels like kind of a free conversation. Okay. The couple of things I've been wrestling with. One, I am um, totally um, irritated with two things, two things. Well, more than two, but two on top. One is this whole um, tendency of the media to keep calling um, keep labeling things that are going on or, or people that are going on Christian nationalists, Christian nationalists. I think that is a misuse of, of, the, of the word Christian. I think if you are Christian, you are supposed to follow what Jesus says to do. And these people don't even like Jesus. Um, I mean, and I'm not speaking off the top of my, if you read some of my writings, you see some of the things that I've quoted, but um, they have a problem with the Jesus of the Bible. And that's, you know, what I grew up with. And in, um, in my Sunday school lessons, the Jesus of the Bible was very specific and they um, have kind of remade Jesus to fit their own ideological, ethnic and racial pre preferences. Um, and so like some years ago, I think it was um, um, Falwell, Jerry Falwell Sr. said that Jesus is a he-man. You know, they, they don't like the, even the imagery of Jesus, you know, the pictures and, you know, the long flowing hair. I don't like the pictures either for a different reason, but they think, think that he looks too effeminate. And so they made him into um, a he-man and they, 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 they push his hyper masculinity out. And that's the Jesus that they have created for themselves. There's no mention of love and forgiveness and beloved community would be out the door. I mean, all of that. Um, they um, believe that uh, Jesus came to help the, the, the rich people, the capitalists, the wealthy. Um, and, it's, and it's a really, I mean, I, it's something that I wish people would really read and study because the use of, you know, Christian imagery and Christian language or verbiage to, um, to verify or to, to valid, validate the things that people do, to me is offensive, it's offensive. Um, and so that's the one thing I, I, I keep railing about, I've written a couple of things, don't call them Christian, but call them something else, call them religious, call them, you know, call them, I don't know, but don't call them Christian. Um, but it's a convenient <clears throat> moniker to use. And it's especially offensive in that the founding fathers, everybody's always talking about the founding fathers, and you know that they wanted this to be a christian nation and they specifically said they did not want this to be a christian nation they believed that jesus existed but that he you know they didn't believe in the metaphysical components of what um is put about him in the bible and so they um they'd say it's not a christian nation but people latch onto that and then 
and then they and then and then they rally people around there. So that's a problem. And then uh, and then con concurrent with that, for me, is the language of of religion period or Christianity because this is you know primarily right now a Christian nation. Um, but the, the language of, of, of religion to me kind of um, promotes the idea of white supremacy of, you know, there's a master and there's a Lord and there's a king and all that. And we're supposed to fall down to the master. And I'm finding, Mark, that I can't, I can hardly use those words anymore. Even though I love God and I, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I can't use those words because to me, it's been, it, they've been used to kind of put people where we are, all of us, any of us who call ourselves American and, and Christian are kind of in this, this, this kind of in a, a zone where we just, okay, Jesus, God, you know, we don't have any, any capacity to think or to, to make our own decisions or all that. And I, and it's just troubling to me. And so those are the two of the things that are bothering me. That, and then, then the third thing that's bothering me is I hate the media. I hate the way the media portrays things that are going on. I, I hate the way um, the headlines are written. I've always hated it. Um, I've been reading about how I don't believe, you know, so I wrote this book, I'm rambling, but I, I wrote this book called the, um, With Liberty and Justice for Some, the Bible, uh, the Constitution and Racism in America. And then the next book I'm going to write is, how, is, is I'm going to include in that the media, the print media primarily, and how the media has done a lot to uh, promote the, the um the, the image and the, and the conceptions of who black people are, what black people do, how black people live, they don't even know. Um, they have, and they have admitted, you know, I have read enough to know that some of these publishers have admitted that maybe their, their headlines were wrong or they were inaccurate, but they sold newspapers. So at the bottom or underneath everything that's going on, it's always money, it's always money. And so for, uh, because people have been in quest of a profit, as opposed to being in quest of truth or justice for everybody, then the whole country is screwed up. And I think that we are on a very dangerous precipice. I think that we are headed toward um, some pretty grim days. We've had grim days before in this country, so that part of it doesn't bother me. But you know, this is the grimmest that I have experienced since I've been alive. But I think it's more, it's sad because the media is feeding it, you know, the so-called mainstream media is feeding it. I don't even know why people who are not, you know, so-called mainstreamers complain about the mainstream media because the mainstream media helps to keep the, the garbage going. That's what it does. And so, um, but I'm angry at the media. I just wish that they would shut up. I never even watch the news anymore. I check headlines, see what's going on, but I don't watch the news. I refuse to do it because I get to think what I need to think. I don't get to be, I don't have to be told what I'm supposed to think about what's going on. So I don't know if that's why I was supposed to come on here tonight, but you've opened the door. So, and I've been struggling and wrestling with this stuff. So I just thought I'd share a little bit of where I am. So, the term Christian nationalism, and, and we are dealing with the, the term nationalism, white nationalism, white supremacy, that whole deal. Um, as a society, we, we're moving t towards a reckoning, uh, possibly. Um, in in Christian faith, uh, it's called kairos, you know, God's time, time that things interact with human history. Um, do you see that coming? Do, do you see a kairos time? I think we're in a Kairos moment. I absolutely do. Um, I think that, and I, and I don't know what it what it means or what it will mean. Um, I think that there will be some. There's going to be a lot of suffering. I think that there's, and I, I mean, I just see it coming, um, <clears throat> and that's troubling. But like I said, there have been bad times before when people suffered. Right? There have been bad times, and so because because I know that. I'm not scared out of my gourd, but I'm concerned. And I keep thinking that maybe it didn't have to be this kind of reckoning, whatever it's getting ready to be, which does not feel good. Maybe it didn't have to be this kind of reckoning, but it is this kind of reckoning because America has never admitted who America is. America has never admitted the cor her corrupt foundation. You know, how can you declare that you're a land of the free and home of the brave which came some later with the Pledge of Allegiance, but how can you declare that when your very foundation is built on the enslavement of human beings? It's like it doesn't work. And so there's been a, there's been a fight, you know, between 
this whole idea of what America is and uh, as opposed to what America is. So when people say, make America great again, which they're really saying is make America white again, that is really what they believe. And to be honest, when you read what what this founding fathers did, they did, they, they, they were white people making a country for white people. They believed that, that uh, many of them believed that this traverse of the of the Atlantic Ocean from England to this new uninhabited what they said was an uninhabited world was was their exodus. It was their exodus. God did it for them. And so when they came, they were clear in their minds that God had sent them, these white people, to this country to make white people. So then they could not feel bad about you know, the genocide that they committed on the Native Americans. They couldn't feel bad about it because their religion told them that they were doing the right thing. So all of that is the foundation of what America is. And we've never come to a reckoning, the words that you're used, we have never admitted it. it the R word is almost worse in this country than the N word. If you call somebody a racist, they're ready to fight you and you want to say, what the hell? What are you What are you fussing about? This is what we have been taught. It is in our DNA. And we have never, ever, ever admitted it. And as long as we've not admitted it, you know what it's like, uh, Mark? It's like a disease that's not treated. It's a disease that's not treated. If you have diabetes and you don't take your insulin, you're going to get pretty sick and pretty soon you're going to die from the disease. And the disease of this country is white supremacy. That does not mean that all white people are bad. That is not what it means. It just means that the systems, the whole government structure that was put in place was put in place and is working the way it was intended to work. And we have never admitted that. So we have pretended that we, you know, love everybody. We have never loved everybody. Even Benjamin Franklin, you know, he was mad at immigrants. He thought that the Germans were not white enough. What the hell is that about? Um, so we've always had a problem and we've never admitted it. We can't heal. People say we want to heal. You cannot heal until you face the truth and say the truth. It's like being an alcoholic. If you are an alcoholic and you never say, I guess, yeah, if you've never, if you never say I am an alcoholic, then you cannot heal. America needs to say we are a racist nation and we cannot and will not say it. Therefore, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yes, the 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 concept or the terms or the process that you're asking for, I think, is called truth and reconciliation. Uh, and we always want to jump to the reconciliation part and not deal with the truth. Uh, and then the interpretations of truth for so many people is, uh, you know, well, we we dealt with that, didn't we? We dealt with that. That was what we dealt with in the '60s. You know, that was the '60s. Um, and then. But we're still in a, in, a, in a need to understand that the injustices of the society, as you're saying, are, have historical roots. And unless those roots are, are, are somehow uh, ripped out and, and recreated into a whole new being, uh, I think, yeah, we, we have some issues to do. So I haven't heard you speak much about reparations in any of your work. Have you thought much about what that would mean and whether that is a, a, a common call to action right now? Oh, I definitely think there need to be reparations. Um, you know, the, the conversation and the debate is what, what does it look like? You know, do you put a check in everybody's hand? I don't believe that. I think that there are things that reparations could handle, like the crummy schools in our neighbor in our communities. Reparations, you know, because the 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 reason our neighborhoods and our communities are there is because they were planned to be that way. And when people live in communities where there are no jobs, and then there's violence and there's crime and all of that. Reparations in our communities would be one of the first things that that I would want. You know what, let me share something. This is, this is kind of, when I was a reporter in Baltimore, I did a series of stories on homelessness. And I went to people's homes and um, I can still remember, I can remember it like yesterday, these great, you know, they have those great big, beautiful, like brownstone type homes in Baltimore. And then they, you know, they break them up into apartments. And so, um, I was going into those places for the first time. Most of many, many of our problems are caused because we do not see. We 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 keep ourselves from seeing what we don't want to see. So you know, I had never really seen that type of poverty, and I, you know, but I knew that there, there was a huge um, poor population in Baltimore. So I did a couple of stories going into these homes, and I was devastated by what I saw. I was devastated by seeing how people live, and so. 
I went this this particular time, and I'm thinking about this now because my furnace went out last week, and I was all week without heat, and I was very cold, and it took me back to this um, this this home that I went to it was one of those great big old homes, and they didn't have any heat, and it was 11 degrees outside. Mark, it was 11 degrees. So they were in the kitchen, the whole family, there were like four or five kids and a mom. Uh, I didn't, don't remember if the dad was there, but on the day that I was there, there was no dad there, but there were four or five kids and the mom in the kitchen. They did everything in the kitchen um, and they had the stove on to keep warm. And when I went through my thing this week, I just thought of how, 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 insulting it is for a nation to call itself the wealthiest nation in the world and we have that type of poverty reparations for me would mean that those types of things were fixed that everybody would have health care all of our people in our in our communities have worse health problems than everybody else reparations would make sure that we got health care reparations would would help um um uh, infuse um uh, create our schools. That's the biggest one for me, and the healthcare, um, and and help the nation. I think uh, probably an ethical reparation would be telling the story of how our labor built this country. So reparations would be physical, and it would also be spiritual and and uh, uh, psychological as well. Thank you. Yeah. So the the concept of uh, somebody mentioned in the in the in the chat about uh, are we talking these historical, uh, Aaron's on, okay. Um, we're talking about these historical uh, characteristics of society. Are they, uh, how much is it religious uh, uh, um, caused? Uh, what, is, what is the center of religion? I had an argument with my, my advisor way back in college and back in the early 80s, uh, and they were talking about how religion was the source of everything and i was like no it's the the the, the lust for land is land you know the land control was and but and then he would overplay the idea and then miss williams my other second she she was always worried about me being co-opted she's like you always want to cooperate with people but you're going to be co-opted and so um wh how do you play through that when you're t talking about building a community building building resistance you you have people coming from a whole different historical viewpoints. Sometimes uh, some folks are just wanting to uh, get one thing done, and then they're they're happy that you know you know whatever it is, uh, make sure that the 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 the, the playground is painted purple and, instead of green. What whatever their issue is, some folks are very very superficial. Not super. I, I don't want to say negatively that, but they have just they have their agenda, what they want to get done. And then once they get it done, they're done. And and they don't see the larger picture of what needs to be done. Do you hear what I'm saying? So, you know, how 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 do we see, how do you see um, us getting into building a community that has historical recollection, that has some spirituality to it? Because I think that's what the Ohio, Peace, uh, the Ohio uh, Poor People's Campaign is all about, is trying to infuse some of that spirituality that were, were was so part of, of, of so many different uh, movements in the past. Well, you know, um, Reverend C.T. Vivian, I, I, I'm still working on a book about him, but one of the things he stressed to me um, was that the civil rights movement was spiritual. He mm -hmm. said, don't write anything. If you can't write, write that it was spiritual, don't. And he would say that you cannot be a Christian and be racist, which I absolutely believe, but I also believe you cannot be a Christian, be sexist, or be homophobic. You just cannot, if you are a Christian, if you follow the dictates of Jesus the Christ. Um, and I, and 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 religion, unfortunately, unfortunately, has spoon-fed this white supremacist theology. It's an ideology that they call theology, and it has made people believe that that God is on the side. Of white people in oppression, and so they use the, the ham doctrine to justify slavery. Yeah, the ham doctrine, they interpret it wrong, but yeah, some people weren't slave, but it was never chattel slavery. It was never the, the chattel slavery that we have in this country, but the Bible was used to, to validate behavior that was absolutely anti-Christian. And so um, 
the church had a vested interest. It seems to me, as I've studied, that the church and the state have worked hand in glove. They've worked together. You, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Because at the end of the day, the goal was always profit. Money is at the, at the root of most of all of this stuff. People were brought to this country and enslaved so that they could work the fields and make money for this country, but for other countries as well. It's, it's the labor, it's the plantation theology, the plantation economy that made the country wealthy. And so, the, you know, who the persons were as human beings was not tantamount. What was important was that they were able to work. They were not seen as human beings. And the church said nothing about it. The church, the people who call themselves Christian said nothing about it. That's why churches, Christian churches could put black people up in the, in the, in the, um, in the balconies or keep them outside. You know, Gandhi said that if, if Christians would follow Jesus, that it would, it would revolutionize the world. Gandhi made a visit to a church, tried to make a visit to a church, and he was put out. He was not allowed in because he, you know, was a brown-skinned man. But when you look at, you know, how the church has manipulated, oh my goodness, manipulated the Bible um, in order to protect white supremacist beliefs, it's this. Let me show you something. Um, yeah. Don't show us that. Oh no, I'm sick. I'm <laughs> I always want. I always keep, like to show this to people. It's called yes, the Negro Bible. And it was written by white folks um, who did not want black folks <laughs> to think that they were, they were entitled to be free. And so what they did was they altered the Bible so that if, when black folks learned to read, it was illegal for them to learn to read, but when or if they learned to read, they, the, the white folks, this was actually produced over in England and then it was, you know, put um, throughout the, the British colonies and came to the United States as well. But they wanted them to get a certain message. The churches wanted people to get a certain message. White people, black people, everybody get the same message. And it's the message of the people in power. So in the book of Genesis, for example, I won't do the whole thing, but Genesis in the standard Bible, there's 50 chapters. They took out a whole bunch of chapters. So in the slave Bible, there's only 14 chapters. In Exodus, in the regular Bible, there's 40 chapters. In the slave Bible, there's only two. No Leviticus, no Numbers, none of the prophets, none of Joshua, none of Judges, none of Ruth. Um, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, all of them are taken out, taken out. None of the Psalms, 150 Psalms, Every single one was taken out of the slave's Bible. Um, the book of Isaiah, one of my favorites, 66 books in the standard Bible, 16 in the slave Bible. And then um, in, the, in, the, um, in the gospels, they left Matthew alone. They took Mark out. They took the gospel completely out. And if you read stuff like Ched Myers, you can see why, because you know, Mark was kind of, you know, a revolutionary. He understood the spirit and the, and the cause of Jesus. He understood that this was a Palestinian Jew. He was counterculture. He was on the side of the, of the, of the, of the least of these, the poor and the, 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 the destitute. He was on their side. He, he was, he was, you know, so um, the, the, the people said, well, you can't be in the Bible. What is that about? The Gospel of John, 21 chapters in the, in the regular Bible, six chapters in the slave Bible. It's just amazing to me. So when you read this kind of stuff, you see how complicit the church has been in keeping everything as it is. And there was a guy, a Reverend Marsh, his son, Charles Marsh, is an author and has a, has a you know who he is, right? Well, his father wrote this after Selma, after Bloody Sunday. Um, and his father wrote the sermon. And when I was studying uh, for my book, the Bible, you know, the la latest book that I did, I came across this, this fascinating story that his father had written a sermon called The Sorrow of Selma. And I was so happy. Here yeah, was a white pastor because, you know, white folks will scare their own. You guys, white folks scare each other <laughs> with all the violence. And, you know, if you, if you don't do what we want you to do, we're going to bring our guns, you know, our, our Second Amendment right, and we're going to take you out. That has been the history. And if we don't shoot you, we're going to burn your house down. So that's been the history. So this guy is a pastor. And many pastors, white pastors, would not speak out because of that. So he wrote this sermon called The Sorrow of Selma. And when I was reading, I thought, oh, my gosh, here's somebody that got over the fear and, and walked away from the intimidation and was going to say the right thing. But you know what he said? He said he wasn't sure it was God's will that they walk across that bridge and try to get their voting rights. Hmm. And you know what? I wept. Hmm. Yeah. 
if 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 in the church the place you know the church the, there are two places maybe that you i would have expected in the past uh, to be places where you could find justice and mercy one would have been the church and what one, one would have been the united states supreme court both of which have failed well, thank you, thank you. It's 7:30. I don't want to press you too long. I, you're 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 dropping some knowledge on some folks that in the chat. They're like, I'm 80 years old. Bob is saying, I'm 80 years old. I've never heard of this Bible before. So you I know, know it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's amazing. Uh, even the attentive populace that you know, the folks that claim, you know, we claim ourselves to be, you know, a little bit more aware of what's been on and going on. Um, one thing I, I was going to share just along your line, the Christian century this week was, it talks about Jesus was Jewish and is black. <laughs> so, so that's this week's uh, magazine. So it, there, there, there are some struggles within the Christian Christianity uh, tradition um, where social gospel and, and the, the reality of what that means uh, has been playing out for many uh, over the years. And well, thank you so much and continue blessing on uh, your journey uh, as and, and keep us informed as you're moving forward with what you want us to do, uh, with the campaign. Uh, you and Joan are doing a great job locally here and, and you even got somebody up from Cincy uh, to hear what you're talking about, uh, Mr. Doyle. So. Do, Mr. Doyle, did you have any message or or questions that you might have before we we excuse? And you you don't have to leave. We're just I know that you had other things you may have to do, Susan. So, um, Russ, did you have anything that you may want to share since you you came from Cincinnati? I'll I'll let you have the 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 initial start. If not, then we can move on. Um. You, you have to unmute if you're speaking, I, I think. I don't know if he can do that. Let's see. Can we get you to unmuted, Stephen? That's uh, Russ. Yeah, I, it's up to him. I, I'm asking the um, – there you go. He, he did. I, had, I, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, that's what – that's our famous uh, statements uh, for the last two and a half years now. Is, uh... <laughs> I, I really I, – uh, I don't have a lot of substance, you might call it, but I was right. I've been writing notes as the conversation was going on, and it reminds me remind me of there's there's uh, what they call a historical Jesus, mm -hmm. which is different in my words from the uh, religious Jesus or the uh, belief or faith Jesus. Um, I don't know if somebody would care to elaborate on that. Well, I don't know what to say ahead. about that. I mean, I know there is a historical Jesus, and to me, they're one and the same. I think Jesus has been recreated by people because people didn't like uh, what he stood for. But I think that, that the historical Jesus, to me, means that he actually existed. So even people that don't claim Jesus as the, as the savior will admit that Jesus existed as a human being. That cannot be disputed. And I think for me, as I have understood it, that is what the historical Jesus is. Then the religious piece, you know, somebody said to me um, that Jesus was a Christian. No, <laughs> no, Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> you know, if Jesus was a Muslim, <laughs> he'd probably be killed. You know, he'd probably be that. He was a Jew. So this person argued, oh, he was a Christian. He was, you know, okay. so you don't argue with stuff like that? But I think there is a lot of mis- um, information, lack of understanding of who Jesus is because of the way the religious story has been shaped. And so um, to me, yes, I think that the historical Jesus to me, based on my studies, it doesn't mean that it's right, but based on my studies means that the historical Jesus is the actual person who existed. And I think probably the founding fathers would have um, adhered to that definition of historical Jesus what they rejected was the metaphysical stuff. They didn't go do all the, the, the what you would call probably the religious Jesus, but the miracles and all that. They rejected that. But in terms of Jesus being a live person, they received that and accepted it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the reality uh, for so many people uh, 
is there are values that propel them into social justice work, uh, resistance work uh, to injustice. Uh, Reverend Susan Smith is just speaking t from her perspective and her life story, mine as well, very, very much overlapped. Uh, but I just wanted to have us at least have a, a, a touch. Doesn't mean that there aren't uh, other faiths that are doing the exact same struggle within their own faiths that, you know, the, in the, the Islamic tradition is called jihad. Uh, how are you shaking your religion? How are you shaking your internal, sh you know, how are you arguing with God? How do you argue with God? How do you say, this is not right, God? How am I doing? You know, th those are some things that I think people that are involved with justice. Now, many of us on this in this community are, are either atheists or, or or agnostic i understand that and so i i appreciate your indulgence with us th tonight uh, with this conversation but do you have one last uh tibbet to to to, to depart with uh susan or or have you done your tibbets this is one fun story this is fun to me um so many of the southern people the southern senators call us Okay, so they go to Sunday school, they've been going to Sunday school their whole life, they go to church with their mamas on Sunday mornings. Yeah, so um, this, uh, the late Robert Byrd, who was a Democrat from West Virginia, was being interviewed by a reporter. And he said, well, you know, he was being asked because he was so anti-civil rights. He was so, you know, so the, um, the reporter asked him, do you go to church? Yep, I do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he said, do you, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. I go to Sunday school all the time. I'm a Sunday school teacher. So he gave his whole thing. So then the reporter said to him, well, the story about the Good Samaritan, are you supposed to love your neighbor? And the bird said, I of course know that story, but I get to choose my neighbor. Big in. Therein is the kernel of the of the of the difficulty that we're in because there's a, the matter of interpretation. No matter what's written down, just like whatever I've said, it's been in, in being interpreted in different ways by everybody. But what, regardless of what's written down, it's going to be interpreted differently by people who read it, and we interpret based on our experiences. So, thank you, thank you very much, and and go on, go in God's name. <laughs> thank you so much you guys take care thank you for indulging me thank you very much oh, no, thank you that that was very important and please join us again at every second saturday of the month we're trying to trying to rock the world a little bit and in our little old ways um thank you and uh we'll, we'll have more discussion as as we move forward with this uh but thank you for the a great beginning to this discussion of what is it what what entails building a community and and part of the community is spirituality yeah yeah and how that's defined what does that mean spirituality could be connectionalism with something that's larger than you you know however however we define that but um yeah you're getting a lot of amens and thank yous uh so thank you very very much and we'll see you around and and uh what's the big next big thing uh for the campaign um, you know, I work peripherally with the campaign right okay. now. Okay. You're starting to break up, I think, your voice. It's way, way soft now. Oh, well. Well, we'll, 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 we'll be in touch. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to move to a different kind of subject now, but not really. We're still talking about community and in resistance to injustices. Um, Suzanne, I saw Michael jump on. Is Michael, you ready to go now? Michael Aaron? Hello, and yes. good evening all. I am here. Oh, great. So uh, I know a little bit of your work, and I've... I've you know, I know you, you've you been very active in the driving park area, and I was just just there like 25 minutes ago in driving park. So um, I know that it's it's definitely a, a changing community and uh, one that uh, 
has had such strength. Clifford Tyree and the historical characters that were there have brought us to this point. And now you're picking up a mantle and, and you and your others uh, that you work with are um, picking up a mantle of trying to move this community. Uh, this it, It's very a very prime located community in Columbus, Ohio that has been neglected so long and now it's on a rebound. And so, Michael, I, please introduce yourself to us and, and thank you again for offering to join us in this conversation of what does it mean to build a community and resistance to injustice. Well, hello, Mark, and hello to everyone who is on this uh, Zoom call. I'd first like to thank Suzanne and Bob Petrakis. I do miss the in-person salons uh, over on Broad Street. Uh, for many of you who may not know, Dr. Bob was my first political science teacher when I began my collegiate career. And I started out at Columbus State before transferring on to The Ohio State University. And I remember in Poli Sci 101, Dr. Bob's first assignment was on day number one. Go research COINTEL Pro and just write a half a page report. And I had never heard of COINTEL Pro. I went and looked it up and oh my. And I'm quite sure many of you already know what COINTELPRO is, but if not, I give you that assignment tonight, a Dr. Bob assignment. Uh, driving Park, my home for the last 25 years. <clears throat> I was born and raised on the north side in Kenmore Park, and I moved to Driving Park at the age of 15. Coming from the north side, I remember when Stelzer Road was two lanes coming from the airport to Morse Road. So that's that's the north side. When I arrived on Livingston Avenue, my family lives on Kelton Still. I purchased a home on Lily Avenue, still live in the neighborhood. It was like arriving in Harlem. In Harlem, I visited for the first time also at age 15. It was people of color and it was traffic and buses and zoom, zoom, and there were stores still. And it was exciting. It was a vibrant community. I wasn't afraid to live here. Um, still not afraid to live here. And so at the age of 23, I was still in college, I decided to join the Driving Park Area Commission. Um, many of you are familiar with area commissions, very unique to the city of Columbus. I was one of the youngest at the time to have joined an area commission. Loved it, it was great. Um, but today in Driving Park, we are building upon the legacies of those folks like James Johnson and Florence Holcomb, and yes, Cliff Tyree and Herb Holliman, Folks who taught me the way um, of community building and to be resilient and not to take no for an answer. And also, yes, how to go down to city council and make things happen for your community. Uh, I work at American Airlines. That's the job that pays my insurance. So, but my heart, my passion is here at the Rickenbacker Woods Foundation, where I'm at talking to you live right now. Um, we are the historic uh, one of three National Historic Landmarks here in the city of Columbus. We take care of the boyhood home of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, World War I ace. We also honor the legacy of Granville T. Woods, also from the Driving Park area, Columbus, Ohio, born in 1856. Granville T. Woods is the inventor of over 60 patents. One of the most popular, which is still in use today, is the third rail that powers subways and streetcars today. Black man from Columbus, Ohio, huge in railway and transportation technology. So I guess I'm here though to talk about social justice in driving park. And my goodness, um, we were, our neighborhood has recently been featured in the Columbus Dispatch for the past month and a half, um, and rightfully so, because we have received over the years so much negative attention. Um, there had been gangs, not so much now, but when I moved here, there were gangs, they were heavy, there was street drugs and street and violence, and, but that was all over the city of Columbus. However, Driving Park always made the news. If you don't know about Driving Park, if you are not sure where we are, we're on Livingston Avenue, right between Nationwide Children's Hospital and Nelson Road. And regardless of what you might think about our community when you drive down Livingston, if you just turn into the neighborhood and drive down any one of our streets, 
you will see some of the most quaint, beautiful brick homes, brick Tudor styled homes, the same homes that you will find in Bexley, the same homes like my home, for example, is in Bexley, Clintonville and Upper Arlington. There are nine homes just like mine in Bexley. I purchased mine for 74.5, the homes in Bexley are going for half a million dollars simply because of who lives where. Predominantly African American community here in Dryden Park, different community in Bexley, different community in Clintonville, quite different in Upper Arlington. So we're dealing, you know, with this verge of newcomers to the neighborhood, just like East Main Street in the Near East area before us. Now it's our turn. Prime location, as Mark has already said, right next to downtown Columbus. And so the community is working through these changes and the adjustments. There's fear about, can I pay for senior citizens? Will you be able to pay your taxes? To be honest, as a working person who doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of money, I have that concern also about my taxes. Um, there's concern about you know, when, when Black folks moved into this neighborhood in the 60s and the 70s, let me tell you, uh, white flight happened immediately. Um, there were, At that time, there were still stores yeah, and restaurants and places you can visit and places you can visit and take visitors to. And when the Black folks moved in, the white folks moved out and sold the business. And of course, that story has been repeated all across this country. It is not unique to Driving Park. But those folks like Cliff Tyree and James Johnson stuck it out. They kept the neighborhood together, um, kept everyone as safe as possible. And here we are in 2022, still not only surviving, but thriving. And so the question becomes now, where do we go from here? We have, you know, even current struggles surrounding affordable housing. And, you know, that is a concern all around the city of Columbus, but we, it's not unique to, to driving park. We have experienced building affordable housing in a successful way. Uh, our foundation, Rickenbacker Woods, was a part of that in 2014, where we built in partnership with the Buckeye Community Hope Foundation, a low uh, affordable housing developer based here in Columbus, but they do work all across the country. We built 47 new homes in Driving Park from the ground up. It was right after President Obama got into office that these dollars started to roll in and it finally happened. Beautiful homes, affordable. We're talking 700 bucks a month for a brand new house. And um, the turnover has not been huge. The waiting list is three years long. And you know, where do we find ourselves as a neighborhood in this affordable housing um, conversation? There are folks in the community who said, hey, we've given enough blood. We have no more to give. Um, it's time for, it's our turn for market rate housing. Then you have those in the neighborhood who say, hey, we need to support the city in this and making sure that people who don't make a whole heck of a lot of money still have a safe, clean, new place to live, to raise their children. And if they want to become homeowners one day, maybe this is that transition point for them. So, you know, we are, that's where we are, still thriving, still succeeding, and um, trying to support everyone the best that we can. So I guess, I don't know if you want more of an intro, but I guess it's questions. I don't know, maybe you have some specific right. questions. So the, the, the most current, uh project that's under under your 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 uh preview i don't know if it's been approved yet or not but the the uh, the old bakery the the uh, roads and uh, and uh, uh livingston uh warehouse i guess it was a warehouse but when i was growing up it was a bakery way back when um where are we with that uh development and what, what do you see that as a good thing bad thing you know i i'm going to play you a softball there so um can you, I'm quite can sure you hardball maybe, will come again. Anything like Dr. Ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anything like Dr. Bob, hardball will come eventually, I'm sure. So we'll start soft. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, here, here's my, my personal take on it, not representing the foundation or any neighborhood civic group, just Michael Aaron talking, resident. Uh, I had a pro so Wolda is the developer. And when this first came on the community's radar, I knew that this was going to be a problem. Not even necessarily the development, 
but just the way that Woda went about it. So normally you would hope that a developer would come to the community and say, hey, this is what we'd like to do. We'd like to build this for these folks. What do you think about it? And then the conversation begins. Well, Woda submitted a variance request to the city of Columbus, which of course goes through city council. And the community was notified by variance change. Well, that makes community groups very upset because it's like you didn't have enough respect to come talk to us first. You know, it's kind of like a, people feel that's sneaky and not very forthcoming. So that creates distrust immediately. Um, so, but now that the cat's out of the bag, let's talk about it. Well, the Civic Association needs to make a determination whether they support the project. They have not done that yet. And also the Area Commission will need to, need to make a decision whether they support this project. They have not done that yet. Everyone is still in their fact-finding mode right now. Um, Oda has uh, submitted a second rendering. It looks much better than the first. I personally thought the Spring Hill Suites residence in type of building. Not what you want to see in your community, especially when beautiful and, and Elgin White Children's Hospital is creating such masterpieces right down the street. So, you know, the community is looking for something a bit more um, up to date and less cookie cutter. Then comes the conversation around affordable housing. And that's where it gets interesting. Now, speaking as a person who works for and directs the foundation that was involved in an affordable housing development, I think it will be hypocritical of me to now criticize further affordable housing when I am full aware of the need of affordable housing here in the city of Columbus. I'm fully aware that many people still make $15 or less and that it takes way more than $15 to have a clean, safe place to live. And so I am a proponent of affordable housing. I'm also aware that this cookie factory has been vacant for over 50 years. And, and we often talk about certain people making a neighborhood unsafe. We can say that certain people create problems, but I also am aware that blight and deteriorating buildings create an unsafe and unclean and unkept environment as well. So it's either the people or the building. And really that's what it comes down to currently. And you know, just the way that Walter kind of presented themselves, not, they just, they started off wrong. So that's where we are on the development and that's how I feel about it. And um, I know the community is still kind of up in the air, but I don't know, it doesn't look good for Walter. Yeah, well, thank you. Um... We'll probably have more uh, talk. Uh, let, can we take three commercial breaks real quick? <laughs> and then we'll get back, Michael, we'll get back for sure. Uh, people are asking for some community announcements. So uh, Kathy, if you can make your announcement, Sandy, and then uh, Mimi, before you guys start, uh, Mimi wanted to make sure everybody understood that ComFest is going to be live in Goodell this year, uh, probably a constructed reality. Uh, applications for grants, performances, workshops, all are online, confest.com. Uh, go check them out if you're interested and uh, see you in, uh, next month, she says. So uh, that's Mimi's in. Uh, so Sandy, uh, do you want to start? And then Kathy can uh, do a little advertising. And then we'll get back to Michael. Thank you uh, for I'd love to hear a little bit more about your work with Rickenbacker's uh, effort as well. Yeah, so, great. Great, I'll start. Um, I just posted something. I have two announcements, both will be very short. Um, but one is um, Columbus Community Bill of Rights, where the anti-fracking folks, <laughs> um, we're having a, um, a Rights of Nature workshop in March. So there's plenty of time to register and I have the link there. Um, but we are having this um, nature needs rights to survive. And right now they don't. So. We, and now with this new Intel plant, it's a real problem because it's very disastrous for the water. So um, I'll just leave it at that. If you have questions, I'll put my email down there too and you can, you can uh, or just text me and I can get back with you or, or chat with me. Um, so that was one announcement. The other one is um, move to amend. Um, corporations are not people, money is not speech. We're, we're, we've got 
I think we have 87 people now, co-sponsors in Congress. Um, every, every couple of weeks, it seems like we have another person. So it's really gaining traction. Um, it has for the last you know, eight years, but um, every time it's, it's better and better. But we don't have time to waste on this. When, whenever I look at any problem, the two that were mentioned on the, on the, so far on this call um, during the salon, and you know, it, it really comes down to it, who's, who's running the show here? It's big money. And they have constitutional rights to do this according to um, our Supreme Court. And that's what we really need to nip in the bud. So um, if you're, again, if you have any questions about Move to Men, a lot of you are familiar with it, but go ahead and, um, you know, if, you, if you've already signed up for it, get signed up for it, you might want to sign up for it again if you're not getting our emails. One of the last emails we sent, we don't send a lot, by the way, purposely, but one of the last ones we sent is, um, and you'll get one on Monday, so sign up now and you'll get one on Monday again, is about contacting Joyce Beatty if you're in her area or just in Central Ohio. Uh, contact her because she is the only Democratic Senate, uh, Congressperson who has not signed on to move to amend. She gets a lot of backing from corporate money and she feels like it's a good thing to do. Many of us have talked to her about how this is problematic, um, but she continues. So we really are reaching out to her every Wednesday, but anytime you want, it's fine. Um, and saying, and all you have to do is call her up and say, hey, you know, sign on co-sponsor move to men. Um, again, if you sign on, if you sign that petition, the petition says that you want a constitutional amendment um, that abolishes the ideas that corporations are people and money is speech because they're speech, but they have a lot more money than you and I do, even though we have those same constitutional rights. Um, so go ahead and um, sign up for that. And then you'll, you'll get that email on Monday. Um, and you'll have all the information. Um, otherwise, just please call. So those are the two things. One's move to men, sign that petition, and, and let's call Joyce Beatty if you can. And then the other one is um, about the Rights of Nature workshop. More Every day, more and more important on that one. Um, and you've got the thing there. And then I will post my email so you can get hold of me if you have any questions. Thank, thank okay, you, thanks, Mark. And Suzanne will definitely, as the uh, the meeting recap, we'll we'll send that out. Pat Wright also has uh, House Bill 434, which is a nuclear uh, uh, non oversight bill, basically uh, saying nu nuclear industry is got Ohio and we can take it. So she's going to put out some talking points, and that'll also be in our our uh, recap of the meeting. Uh, Kathy, you have a quick. Uh, few announcements and then we'll get back to Michael. I'm sorry, Mike. And then Adrian uh, Hood has also joined us. So I'd like uh, us to get her involved as well soon here. Yeah, um, actually, I'm going to kick it to Chuck for two announcements and then I'm going to follow up with two and it's we'll make them quick. We just want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events um, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Chuck put one in the chat already. New. Chuck, okay. there you Quick, go. Quickly, Wednesday at seven o'clock, I have a, written an article about a path to an ecological future. Uh, I put the link in the chat to the article. You don't have to read the article, but uh, I'm going to have a discussion and talk about it uh, for about 20 minutes at the beginning of the session on uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. It's, it's a four-part thing. You don't have to go to all of them, but uh, it'll be a fun discussion how to get to an ecological future not easy, but it's possible. Uh, second thing is, is we have a, a Simply Share uh, event. It's a monthly event at Simply Living, and it's, it's going to be Sunday the 20th at uh, 2 p.m. And uh, that's an opportunity to just share and chat about things. And we have a, a uh, Michael Greenman is going to do one of the shares. He's going to talk about an interesting project he has to send out a letter to everybody on the planet talking about how they can prepare for climate action on Earth Day 2023. That's it, back to Kathy. All right, so on February 23rd, I better know when this is, it's Wednesday night at six, I'm gonna be talking with Citizens Climate Lobby, basically about how we built a coalition to win a strong climate action plan. It's a, 
um, an event called Ales and Climate Tales, but it is online this time. Um, so if you'd like to tune into that, that's happening Wednesday the 23rd. Um, then on March the 4th, and I'm going to go get the link for that, um, is we have a monthly sustainability series going on that highlights different sustain city sustainability programs. And so this month, so March 4th is the next one. It's the first Fridays, it's called First Fridays. Um, March 4th is the next one. And that will be, we'll have um, Dave Celebrezzi from Green Spot and then mm -hmm. Ari Alex from Keep Columbus Beautiful. So come and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask challenging questions and, and what you really want to know, ask them so and, and find some information out. And and not, we don't have this yet on the calendar. Let me, let me put that one in here real quick. We don't have yet on the calendar, but we've just set the date for our annual membership meeting, March 20th. And then in April, we are going to be looking to run an eco challenge and put together a team for eco challenge for Earth Month. Um, for people to take sustainability actions, you commit to certain actions, they have measurable results and the team that gets the most, well, you know, it's a friendly competition, but it's part of the National Eco Challenge. So look for that. That's all we got. Thank you very much. And yeah, d definitely I'll put that in the chat and Suzanne can get it to the uh, feedback. Uh, Bob and Jamie wanted to say something. Bob, go ahead and then Michael will get back with you. And then Adrian, Adrian Hood is with us. Uh, a a, a uh, Libya Award winning uh, community activist uh, from the Free Press, and we really want to spend some time with her as well. So, um, what's this? Verbs, are you sharing something? Who's sharing that? Total accident. I have no idea what I'm. I was trying. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it stop, and I, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave and come back. Sorry. That's all right. Okay. Thanks, Verbs. Uh, Steven, can you do something about that? Thank I can't you. make it stop. Leave. We leave. got it. We got it. We're good. Thanks, Verbs, though. That was looked good. <laughs> looked good. Um, so, uh, yeah, Michael, why don't we why don't jump in and, and then we'll, uh, Adrian, we'll be with you very, very soon. Okay, Bob, uh, you had something. Uh, you wanted to say, and then we'll get to Michael and, and Jamie. Yeah, the Columbus Coalition for the Homeless, I meet with them most months, is having a webinar on LGBTQ youth and homelessness on Friday, February 18, from 3 to 4.30. The simplest way to find the link is to look in the free press calendar itself or the Columbus Coalition for the Homeless webinar, I'm sorry, website. It's a free event, and if you are a social worker, you get CEU units for attending. Yeah, so again, that, that's another reminder that Bob does take care of our calendar for free press. Please send anything that's going on in this, in this community that we call uh, um, uh, Columbus, Ohio at this point. We may call it something different later. Um, maybe Rickenbacker. We may be calling ourselves Rickenbacker. Who knows? Um, but, and Jamie, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, uh, let's see. Carolyn Harding is maybe not starring in a, a play called The Laramie Project that I recommend highly. It's really good talking about LGBTQ issues, but in a very intelligent manner. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, so Michael, can you uh, get us back to a little bit of work that you're doing? And and maybe, I don't know if folks know the Rickenbacker uh, project that you, you mentioned that you're in right now, and, and maybe give us a little little thumbnail of that. And then uh, I'd like to get Adrian in, in this conversation uh, because we're getting a little past eight now, but, uh, but thank okay. you very much for being on here. And uh, I know, <laughs> Driving Park is, when you have great opportunity, there's also great challenge. So uh, there's some great opportunity going on in Driving Park right now. And, and I know a lot of people live in that neighborhood that are excited about things. But yeah, the, the, the challenges will be there. Uh, gentrification is always a challenge to community. For sure. And as always, I think we will find our way. In regards to the Rickenbacker Woods Project, <clears throat> 
We are a nonprofit organization. Yes, we take care of Eddie Rickenbacker's house. That's one part of it. We really use the historic significance of this site to cater to the community. So as a resident who lives here, when I would drive by, and at that time, the property was a mess, and the Columbus Dispatch article from 2014 will tell you that things were a mess before we got it cleaned up and got the site renovated. Uh, our, our, our main program, the, the ACE of ACE, is our award-winning after-school program that is offered for free to elementary students, K through five. And we partner with Capital University who come in to tutor the students. We take them on field trips and we have all kinds of science projects and it's really cool. And we help them of course with their homework. And we also work on their social skills because we all know that even adults can use some social skill training, let alone children. And so we focus on all of those mm -hmm. things and yeah. really we tell the story of Granville and Eddie. Both of them dropped out of school at young ages. And if that story really goes to the name of our program, the Inborn Excellence Initiative. It's We realize that all young people have already inside of them excellence. And it's our job to help them find it and to cultivate it so they can do wonderful, amazing things regardless of where they start at in life. Just like Granville T. Woods, just like Eddie Rickenback. And we also do fantastic community events and festivals and financial literacy classes and cooking classes. And we have a beautiful community garden uh, out in our property. We have three parcels of land here and we're going to be obtaining some more. So we do really great, fantastic stuff. And how about this? All of it is for free. We write a lot of grants. We rely on donations and we charge for none of it. What we really miss doing is our uh, once a year college tour where we take students on charter bus, write a grant. Uh, the first time we took them to Central State and Wilberforce University and the National Air Museum. And then we took them to Yellow Springs, which is also now in the news regarding affordable housing. Um, Dave Chappelle, hello. And uh, the second year, uh, we took them to Cleveland and visited Case Western, and we took them to Little Italy for pizza, and then we stopped in, uh, is it Millersburg? Yeah, Mil Millersburg, uh, Amish country, so they can pet the animals. We visit animals because a lot of these kids in this neighborhood, and they're high school students that we take, 40 of them each year, they've never petted a goat and got to feed animals and been out there in the middle of nowhere in the country and kind of seen what life is like out there. So we do all of this once again for free. Thank you to our uh, grant supporters and those who invest and donate to Rick and Back. So yes, we do the history part, which will become a museum by 2023, by the way. Visit our website, rickandbackerwoods.org. Um, but we do a lot of other things that are really beneficial to the community, besides the history piece. Thank you, Michael. And, and if you can stay on, please stay on. We'll have more conversation, I'm sure. Uh, Adrian, are you, Miss Hood, are you available um, to now share some of your insights on the struggle of building community in resistance to just injustices and uh, your strong voice uh, did, re we did recognize your work uh, as a Lib Libby Gre Gregory Award uh, winner for uh, us. I don't know if you understand that that for our community that is very very important and uh, for you to have received that we wanted to to really honor your work that you've been doing and and sorry uh we we need to uh be so late at getting you on here today but thank you for jumping on and and please share with what you'd like to share with today please um well first of all thank you um i apologize um, if I was supposed to be on earlier um, and and missed it, um, that's the beauty of this wow. sort of flow around, <laughs> you know, flow around. <laughs> yeah, um, I I just did hear my phone um, because it's on silent, and I was in the house running the sweeper, and I just happened to catch it. But um, you know, nonetheless, thank you. Um, you know. Uh, to everyone in this space who has been uh, very supportive, um, been uh, supportive, you know, since the beginning uh, when my son was uh, murdered. 
um, by two Columbus police officers um, here uh, in June of 2016, two plainclothes police officers. Um, it has been a trying few months. Uh, we did have our wrongful death uh, trial that ended in a in a um, in a hung jury. Um, so unfortunately, I will have to um, go through all of this again um, come April, um, which is quickly approaching. Um, but nonetheless, are uh, looking forward to uh, the victory um, this time around. Um, as far as, you know, things in the community, uh, right now, I just really have been, I'm trying to be, um, uh, as supportive as I can of the newer, um, people who, uh, unfortunately are now a part of the involuntary club, um, what I have termed it to be, um, you know, Casey Goodson, uh, Jr., we just had celebrated his birthday and, you know, just being there with his mom for the community event um, that they did. Uh, my son's birthday um, is actually next month, uh, March the 20th. And, um, you know, just anticipating uh, that day and the lack of celebration um, of his presence in celebration uh, is always a, a piece to deal with as well. Um, uh, the other things uh, in the community, I really have just been trying to uh, pay attention to uh, the moving pieces that are going on. Um, we did just, uh, the mayor did just name our first um, inspector general who also uh, uh, comes to us by way of Detroit. Uh, so we have a police chief um, who was Detroit a former, um, yeah, I, I, when I, when I shared the article, I said, uh, Columbus, the new Detroit, <laughs> when I, when I shared the article, um, but, um, I definitely, you know, will be keeping my eye, uh, on, on these two and, and what this, what this turns out to be, um, I have had reservations from the beginning, not because of the review board, um, because I, I feel like that is something that we definitely um, needed. And I think that the mayor um, and the city did it at the time that they did to calm um, the city, uh, because at the helm of that is Janet Jackson, the same city attorney who fought the Department of Justice when they came in in 99. Um, so I'm always, you know, waiting for the lever to drop, so to speak, uh, when it comes to uh, how they move the same individuals, just the recycle of people in and out of the space um, is, is always leery to me and myself, like probably many others in the community, was not aware of all of these intricate pieces um, because I was doing life, right? Raising my children and just trying to maintain. But um, now that I've had to have this exposure and, and be involved, uh, you know, and I, and I see the players and how they are moving in and out, uh, it is my hope that when 2023 comes around, uh, that we will be looking at a lot of changes as far as city leadership is concerned um, because uh, because it's needed, it's necessary, and the time is right now. Um, so those are uh, some of the things, you know, that, that I've been doing. Um, I volunteer um, in, a, in a lot of different uh, spaces. Um, you know, and I have four grandchildren now, so um, I, I'm, I'm staying busy. And busy, I guess, keeps me out of trouble, <laughs> but I don't mind good trouble. <laughs> so, um, you know, thank you, um, you know, again, like I said, just for the support of everyone here um, from the beginning. Um, I know when I was, uh, uh, when Ms. Susan reached out to me uh, for the award, uh, last year, uh, 
I had I honestly had forgot when she first reached out to me. And then when she did again, I was like, oh, let me look and see who this is before I accept what this is that's going on. So um, uh, definitely an honor uh, to be uh, nominated um, by someone um, in in honor and in remembrance of someone who was definitely a trailblazer. Um, I definitely uh, appreciate that and hope that um, I continue to live up to that um, for for you all and the rest of our community. And um, I, I just know at the end of the day, we will see the changes um, that we want to see, uh, but we have to um, remember to do it collectively. So I appreciate you all. Yeah, that, that's very important in the, in the uh conversation about community it is collective it is a it is not a one person show um how are you finding strength in in community and collective action i i know you you you've this has not been a pleasant six six years that you've had to go through but um the strength and and energy that you've found uh how 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 has that helped how has that moved you forward a little bit um, with God, all things are possible yes, that, man. you know, that is, uh, my, my, my mantra, my, uh, the scripture that I stand on, uh, probably for the rest of my life is Proverbs three, uh, five and six, you know, and, and I just know that I have to trust in God, you know, and I'm thankful that, um, that I don't have to have all of the answers because I have someone that I can look to for those answers and for that provision. Um, so I'm definitely grateful for the relationship um, that I had with God before this happened. Um, I think that that has helped me stay anchored and stay grounded. Um, and it's also uh, been one of the driving forces for me to know when I need to sit down um, and, you know, and take that break and, you know, kind of uh, restore and replenish uh, myself. So um, um, I, I, I just say that he has been amazing and sending um, me the people that have been so um, supportive. I, I cannot imagine someone having to walk through this um, by themselves. And I have talked to others, um, not here in Columbus, uh, necessarily, but from across the, you know, the country that, you know, unfortunately have felt very alone and very isolated. And so I um, don't take for granted uh, the community that has come alongside me um, to do this fight with me. And, and that gives me strength when I can't um, pray for myself or feel myself being very discouraged. I can feel that someone is praying for me somewhere um, because I continue to get back in the race and in the fight. So uh, my relationship with God has definitely uh, been my cornerstone and my community has been amazing. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm gonna get, go switch a little bit. The, the uh, driving park area, that Michael was talking about. You you caught a little bit of it when you were coming on. Um, it was the 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 first reaction after after George Floyd's uh, death. It was where the first action happened in Columbus, Ohio, um, and then everything went downtown the days after. But that first was so. Michael, you might want to join in on this too. But how how do how do actions, how do, how do, how does community respond to drama and trauma in, in a collective way? And what's the best way, what, what, where have we learned to, to, to have the most power uh, from a community to, to express themselves and to, to get something done? You know, the, we heard all the accolades of the mayor and everything saying, you know, oh, we're the most welcoming city to, but you know, what kind of really the policies where 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 do we see the traction uh and and that kind of work um of getting yeah, something yes yeah so um interestingly enough um the the first action 
um, that happened behind um, the video that went viral of uh, Chris being assaulted um, by those police officers. Um, Christopher actually used to be um, one of our, our neighbors when I was growing up. He His mother lived right next door to my grandmother. I did not realize um, initially that that was him until uh, my brother uh, called me, you know, later on um, that day. Um, but to, um, to your question, there is no one, there's no one thing that has to happen. I think that what made the mayor and city council uh, respond in the way that they did was because there were a lot of things going on at the same time. Um, the protests um, were going on, they were kind of used to that, you know, because we've been out there before. They were not used to the number of people that came out for that protest. They definitely were not used to or prepared for the amount of damage that happened coming out of um, those protests. And in, in, in my honest, um, opinion and thought about about that i believe that the damage was the catalyst um that made the mayor uh react the way that he did that is when he signed um the executive order for uh officer involved shootings to be handled by the bci um something that we have been asking for since my son was killed and i know mothers who have been asking for that prior to my son um, being killed, um, we have been asking for um, uh, the review board uh, prior to, but when I rode down High Street and seen the damage that that happened um, in downtown, I couldn't even believe, I never thought that that would happen here in Columbus. Um, but I, I, I feel like you know, I, I I don't condone, you know, the, the destroying of property um, at all. However, I know that that was the driving force um, to get city council to um, finally get some kahunas <laughs> to speak about um, the injustices that, you know, that were, that were going on, that have been going on, but they were finally at a place um, you know, to acknowledge it, Joyce Beatty, uh, Shannon Hart, and, and Kevin Boyce, you know, all of them getting maced. It's like, oh, no, we got to do something about that. And it's like, so y'all just now realizing that that was a thing, you know. Um, so I say, like I said before, I'm glad that they did eat that mace because it made them step into action and, you know, and and finally um, we're willing to step up and say something um, about this police department. So all of those things that were going on, um, there is a time and a place for everything. And because of all of those things and having um, individuals leading those spaces um, with, with the same end goal in mind, um, I think is is what caused us to, you know, to be in that in that space at that time, um, you know. But we have to continue to apply the pressure because, as you see, um, when we quiet down, um, so do they, and they go back to, you know, life and business as usual. One of the questions coming up about the civilian uh, review board: uh, What do you have concerns about it being able to? meet its mission and whether its mission is even uh what should be happening i know you, you don't, um i know you don't like miss jackson i know that. <laughs> so I, I i i'm not gonna say that i don't like her because i don't know her right okay. um but i do not like the, the roles that she has played and the con contributions that she has made to those roles um you know i had someone tell me you know 
the the pressures of being the the first black woman and such and such and so on, you know, and how hard that is, and you know, and all of those things. And and I'm like, you know what? I understand exactly what you're saying. However, how important is your integrity to you? You know that 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 that's just my response um, to that. Um, so I, I, I'm still concerned. I'm still concerned, and I'll probably continue to be concerned as long as um, she is in that in that leadership role. Because when she was over the um, uh, the community review board that uh, that the mayor had put in place, when those officers turned in their complaints um, about racism, she didn't even um, make those letters known to uh, the other members that was on that was on that board with her and, and had responded to these police officers. And they would not have known. One of those police officers reached out to me personally, and I reached out to someone that I knew was on the board to ask if they had even discussed the letters and they weren't even aware of them. So that's how that whole thing unfolded. So my question is, are you going to continue to be a gatekeeper for the orchestrated evil, or are you going to do due diligence to that position? And based up on the things that I've seen of her in the past, I don't, I just don't trust that she will. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Oh, well, I um, appreciate what you're doing out in the community. I know you, you were, you were uh, recruited involuntarily i know that um yeah oh boy yeah as one person says yeah but you know um i you know as as hurtful um you know because i i will continue to say i don't think that there is a worse pain um on this side of heaven than losing um a child um and uh but I also am thankful for all of you, you know, that I've had the opportunity to meet that I probably would not have, um, you know, if if my life was just going on, you know, as it was. So, um, you know, I say all the time, you know, in situations, there's blessings and lessons, right? And and I feel like in in this in this tragedy. Um, I have gotten a lot of both, um, you know, and, and I'm thankful for that, you know, because I don't give up easily. I never have. Um, I've always been a fighter and a champion for the underdog. Never thought of myself as being, you know, in, a, in, in this because this is a grand scale underdog kind of situation, um, you know, to be coming up against the city and coming up against the laws of this country and things like that. But um, but I'm going to fight. And it's not just a fight for it's not just a fight for my son. This is more about a fight of keeping other people's children alive yeah. and, and making our officers be held accountable when they don't protect and serve, you know? And so I'll, you know, I'll continue, um, I'll continue to do that until God says, you know, don't. And, and right now I, I feel like till I take my last breath, you know, I, I'll be fighting um, for, for something, you know, to, to, to be changed because change has to continue to happen. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to jump a little bit. Mike and, and you, uh, Ms. Hood, are from two very urban parts of Columbus. Um, urban meaning very dynamic, uh, Africa-centric in a lot of ways, uh, and, and are in the media mislabeled in so many different ways. Um, how is that community, those communities, you know, you drive in Park, Linden, 
are areas that are um, seeing their way into what it is to be new, a new community, uh, but challenged. Um, how, how are, what are some bright spots that you're seeing, Michael, if you want to jump in, Adrian, um, about what, what's going on in the communities that you're living in right now? I let Michael go first since I've been talking so much. He was saying, I'll <laughs> let you go. And then, uh, yeah, okay. So, oh. Mike, how about, <laughs> he was pointing to you. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Um, I'll, I'll say, even on the point of police interaction, and <clears throat> for several minutes ago, um, from your question about those protests, I was out there that day, the first protest in regards to Chris. Oh, I can't believe how many police showed up immediately on Livingston Avenue and really it was Kelton and Galt where the police surrounded the crowd mm -hmm. in Dragon Park for that protest. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. there, I mean, they were there quick. And I'm like, oh, well, we, we kind of knew that they were kind of hiding back around the corner. Anyway, you know, there's, there are people in the neighborhood who, I don't want to say that the police can do no wrong, but they feel as though the police are the only source of protection. Um, I get that. So for National Night Out last year, you know, which is usually about the police and the community working together, we partnered with Think Make Live, social justice group, Terry Green, and APDS, Afrocentric Personal Development Shop, um, to put together a social justice theme national night out. Now, normally the police come out to these national night out events. I mean, they come out, they celebrate with you, you know, they bring treats and buttons and, you know, we had advertised about this social justice theme national night out and not one officer came. I mean, not one, which made me notice and go, oh, well, maybe they don't feel our theme. Maybe it's going to be anti-police. It really wasn't. The point of this event with the social justice theme was to put out a survey to the community. How do you feel about the police interaction in driving park? What do you want to see as far as police uh, patrols and things in your neighborhood? What's it like for you, your experience, your interaction? And to be honest, the results surprised us. And I can send that, you know, I, the, the results surprised us in that a lot of the young people, half the uh, respondents were young people underneath the age of 21. Half of them didn't have a problem with police officers. Some of them, had, most of them had good interactions as far as like being in the schools. And, you know, that's a big conversation right now. But there were those. Here's a here, here's the main takeaway. And I and when I sub, when we submitted these results to the city, I said the answer to your questions and concerns about police are right here. One of the respondents said, "The problem is the older police officers. This old school mentality. The younger officers seem to have a better understanding and how to deal and adapt to the situations of the inner city." These old school ones with these old thinking mentalities. I have friends who are black and white, who are police officers, men and women, black and white. They have told me the stories of way back in the day, the 80s and the early 90s of what used to go down in that old jailhouse, which is now the city attorney's office, the old school jailhouse, and how people used to get beat when they would go up that elevator to go upstairs. Police officers told me these stories. So this old school, we need some new officers and some new ways of thinking. And we said, we made these suggestions to the city. I don't know where the new police chief is going to take it. The new safety director is going to take it. But there has to be a new way, a new approach. Some things have got to change because we know we can't be anti-police, but we can be anti how you behave with our people. So that's kind of where we are. I guess I can't speak for everybody in Driving Park, but for a lot of us, that's where we are. We know we need you, but you've got to treat us a certain way. Otherwise, it's going to be trouble. So I don't know how it's going down in Linden, Miss Adrian. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, Linden has, you know, we, we've had a trauma with the, the police department for, for a long, 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 long time. Um, 
you know, and it, it was interesting that you uh, brought up, uh, Michael, the, um, the the stories of the, the police officers themselves, um, because I have a couple of um, friends who um, were either police officers during that time or their parents were. And um, one of my friends in particular, her father, they actually convinced their father to leave the police department because they knew that the officers were going to set him up some kind of way to lose his life because he was the black officer who figured out how it was that they were going around those black officers and getting promoted and he filed a lawsuit and he won. And um, she just happened to come across um, two older white police officers and brought her dad's name up. And that officer said to her, I hate your father. Like had no filter, no, I mean, traumatized her right there on the spot. So yeah, that, that, that old guard, uh, it, it has to go. It has to go. And, and I just read an article, I think it was last week, of how many officers um, put in for that $200,000 um, early uh, buyout mm-hmm. um, and whatnot, you know, and people were complaining, you know, that city dollars, you know, and this, that, and the other. And, and all of that I get, but we want them gone. You'll I do the, feel. You'll pay the 200 and get them out of there, right? You know, I I do feel, however, that the ones who have histories of excessive force should not get it. They should not get it. You should deal with them and get rid of them, um, you know, some other way. Um, But, uh, you know, again, to your point, um, as the new recruits um, come in, one of the things that will have to continue continuously be um, on the radar is the diversifying of the police department. Um, And NPR did a really good article a few weeks ago um, because there are two offices, I think it's just two, it may be more than that, but they they have filed a lawsuit against Columbus Police um, for discriminating in the hiring process. And, And they got receipts. Right. There are some white officers who um, were uh, found guilty of rape and sexual assault and um, just some foolishness. But they're in the academy. So these um, these police officers have, you know, have filed this lawsuit. And it will be interesting to see what all comes out um, in those records. We did have a meeting with um, Chief Bryant. Um, not long ago, uh, myself and some other clergy, and she made us aware that they were going to be going back and doing an audit on the discrimination um, within the hiring process. She did not say if that's something that they are going to make public. She did not say how they would rectify those things when they find them, because I told her, y'all will find them. Like, you may be saying this, just to pacify us. But if you're really going to do your due diligence to look this stuff up, you're going to find it. But she didn't say, you know, what, yes, she didn't say what they were going, uh, what they were going to do. Um, So, you know, like I said, again, we just have to continue to um, apply um, the pressure. And, you know, once this uh, review board is up, um, those that have been harmed in the community that don't want to um, deal with internal affairs, um, you know, I feel like this will be, and, and in that sense, this will be a good space for those um, individuals to go to. But depending on how they're treated and how fair they feel those investigations are, is going to be a big um, determinant uh, factor for the effectiveness of that um, of that office um, for you know that connection with our community. Yeah. Let me thank you both, and I, I and I'm not 
and wanting you guys to speak for the whole community, but I know you guys are there, you're active, you're organizing, and you're hearing things. Um, that that National Night Out example, it was very enlightening because, you know, we over at Reeb Hosack, we do another one that they always come out, but last week they or last year they did not come out. You're right. They did not. You're right. <laughs> so, hey, but, uh, so we weren't the only ones. <laughs> so what? Intro. Yeah, I'm just that saying that that I never really thought of it that way, but yeah, they didn't come out. Yeah. So uh, I have two announcements I need to make real quick, and then um, we can get back to some more discussion if if you got time, please. Um, Joe Moto has has uh, he wants to say some stuff, so I'll let him talk at, when I get done. Um, Mary Jane, I don't know if Mary Jane's still on uh, board, and she she had brought to us a community uh, concern. Uh, one of the uh, main organizers of the, of the original Kent State protests in 1970, who uh, was uh, recovering from a surgery in Oklahoma, and was driving home back to Cleveland area or Overland is where he was. A uh, Bill uh, Arthrell. He was a, a, one of the key organizers uh, back at that time. He he was killed in a car accident this past week, and uh, we just wanted to make sure we brought his uh, life and name uh, to us. And I don't know if Mary Jane wants to say any more, if she's still on or not. But uh, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Mary Jane, if you'd like time. to say more. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I I did know Bill personally. This is you know this is something that a friend of mine though John Pardee, if you read that article yeah. I think I put in there from the Chronicle, was very close to him, and so uh, I I thought it was important to recognize him because the free press or I mean, what would be the free press's origins lay in Kent State, and um, I. I don't know how old you guys are. I was always going, I'm going to these meetings. I'm among the oldest people there. I think I think there are a few people older than I am here, believe it or not. But I do remember the Kent State because I was a senior in high school, and that was a monumental thing for someone who was contemplating going to college. And uh, you know, be, being in the free press sphere, being the sphere for activism, certainly uh, those individuals who were there, who saw that, who reacted, who 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 were birthed into activism by that event, um, certainly would want to recognize Bill. I think because he was just foundational, not not to the not to the the being in the National Guard or anything like that, but foundational to uh, being able to document and uh, have allow uh, the rest of us to understand and appreciate what happened at Kent State over 50 years ago. And I think this particular group too we would be um, very bonded to the ideas and the, these ideals that were um, were um, really tragically, you know, from, from some of the people who were killed that day. But, but those ideas were brought to life in what we do today. And I thought it was real interesting, let me finish with this one thought, that um, uh, I don't know, I guess I didn't know this guy personally, but we see he's, he's obviously missed because of what he, he was, did. But he was also an activist in Ukraine. And I think from today's perspective, what's going on there, um, I don't really quite get it myself, but we might want to pay more attention here shortly. I hope not, but maybe we do. And here's a person who spent the last of his life trying to be an activist in that area. He so went over after the two, yeah, after the 2014 coup, coup and then the Maiden uh, Revolution, all those names you should be hearing more and more, and then you should be hearing about the Minsk Protocols and the Normandy Agreements, all that stuff. If you're not knowing about that stuff, definitely get to know Ukraine a little bit more. But yeah, Bill was started, he moved over there and lived there uh, for long times and was definitely active in the, in the anti-Nazi work that was going on at that point and still is going on. That's part of the whole problem. Uh, Joe, thank you, Mary Jane, and thank you. Uh, Joe, you had a good point, and I'd sort of like you to jump in this conversation that we were talking about the popo and, and other things uh, at city level. Uh, and you may have other things you want to say, but go ahead, please. Oh, oh thanks, Mark. Yeah, well, just an announcement first, and I caught this on uh, Rita Fuller Yates's uh, Black History Facebook page that I know a lot of you know uh, Willis Brown, our, our good friend, and all the work he's done in Bronzeville and so forth. 
but it, uh, they uh, sent out a message that on March 3rd at 4 p.m. at the Lincoln Theater, the city of Columbus and the state of Ohio is going to issue a declaration recognizing Bronzeville, Ohio. Additionally, it's going to be added to the federal bill in Washington, D.C., and that will be formally recognized both in Chicago and Columbus. And, and some of you probably know this is something that Willis has been working on for a really long time. He doesn't like the King Lincoln slash Bronzeville neighborhood. It's Bronzeville, period. And, uh, and so this, and you know, Willis is the mayor of Bronzeville. And, and I jokingly asked him one time, I came up to him, I said, hey, Willis, I said, when's the election? I said, I'm thinking about running against you. And then he just he just laughed, of course, because he does. I was just jerking his chain, but uh, he's done a lot of work in that community. And and uh, I'm going to show up for the event. And I hope others might consider it, too. It's on March 3rd, at 4 p.m. Michael, uh, I just want to say, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I was on the Historic Resources Commission back in the mid 90s. And I remember when the Rickenbacker House came up, when they wanted to tear it down and and uh, came before us and. And we were trying to get the city to allocate fifty thousand uh, dollars towards it. And I know Mr. Motts was there, and he was trying to steal the house. He wanted it out at the museum. And there was a big—I don't know if you're aware of this or not, or if you were around—but there was a battle at that time trying to. He wanted it out at his museum, and the, we wanted it to stay where it was. And I don't recall exactly that fifty thousand was allocated, but I think some money was. But it didn't do a whole lot to, for the house, except maybe put the roof on or something to keep from water getting in and so forth. But I just want to say how neat it's been to see what it's become since in 26 years. And now with the foundation and all the activities and things that that you noted that are taking place now, it's uh, I mean, thankfully, thank God it's it, it was saved and it stayed there because now it's a really important part of a driving park. And also, Adrian, I, I want to thank you for your, your thoughtfulness and your words that we all know are so strong to us and meaningful and everything. And uh, just, again, thank you very much. Haven't seen you in quite a while. I've been busy. I know you've been busy. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll catch up soon. But thanks. Thanks, Joe. You, you did have a sort of interesting insight there on the funding of uh, maybe the 200,000 buyouts going to save the city oh. a little bit of money anyways because of the millions they're going to be paying out on some of those uh, aggressive behaviors that the Popo have been doing. Um, I think uh, last year, they, I think they might have set a record for settlements. Mm -hmm. It was in the over $10 million. It was maybe 15 or something. And I believe the buyout uh adrian it was it 10 million total 200,000, and i think it was for i believe it's, so it's about 50 it seems like i remember seeing that more than that yeah but anyways i think it'll probably save us money in the long run yeah because andre hill alone was um 10, 10 million dollars last year yeah I think it was a record in uh, police settlements last year. Yeah. 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 Well, I know we're getting long on on wind, and we like sort of getting into just the the shooting the breeze around. Uh, Adrian, do you have anything you want to say at the end? And and Michael, uh, since you're our, our guest tonight, and then we'll probably just sort of maybe even take the recording off and start just shooting the breeze and and start getting a little bit more vernacular and all that stuff? Um, I just like, you know, like I said, um, I just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I just really appreciate um, everything that um, that that y'all have been doing. I, I'm thankful for the many, many things that I have been able um, to learn. Uh, Mr. Joe is, probably like hands down one of my favorite people <laughs> because he just knows so much um, about the history and the players and um, those dots that I need connected. I will I will hit him up on um, Facebook Messenger or something and be like, hey, you know, I was reading such and such and it doesn't sound right. And he'll just come with the whole, you know, story and and you know, just cre uh, finish that that picture um, for me. And, you know, so I, I, I'm just thankful um, for it because I, I went back and forth 
you know, about running for office and, you know, and everything. Um, but I, 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 for a long time, I felt like I'm behind the, the curve a little because there's so many things to learn about this city that I just was not aware of um, and whatnot. But, you know, the, the work that y'all do, um, like I said, reaching out to Mr. Joe um, because of the, the history um, pieces that um, I've learned from being in, you know, in spaces like this. I, I'm forever grateful um, for those. And so um, the last thing I will ask is, you know, um, please keep my my family in your prayers, your thoughts um, for a victory uh, come April the 11th uh, when our trial starts again. Uh, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I love you all. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Hood. And yeah, we'll keep you in our thoughts and prayers and your, your faith is uh, how we started this conversation at the beginning of this uh, salon we were talking about how faith is critical or or spirituality so, you know the connection to the larger whatever is um is so important in in the work that we're doing and and, and your, your testimony has been very strong thank you um the president the president has a quick announcement michael i know you need to maybe get going too i'm not sure but um the president of the board has an announcement, and and do you want to say that real quick, Pete? Pete Johnson, our, our president of the board of the Free Press, and then Michael will let you say your final words, and then we'll probably uh, Stephen. Oh, Jamie has an is uh, something. Okay, go ahead, uh, Pete. Well, anyways, Pete just was mentioning that there there's going to be a meet and greet with Morgan Harper, uh, and he put it in the chat. So we'll we'll have that as well. Um, Jamie, do you have something you wanted to throw into the the hapa hapa? And then I'm going to have Michael do, do a final say, and then and then we'll we'll Stephen will probably cut the uh, the uh, recording, and then we can get into some some real talk. You know, this is all done. This is all done for a show, you know. No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Go ahead, Jamie. Want me? Uh, I want to do want to say that uh, Carolyn Harding and Charlotte Owens, who is on here right now, are both running for state representative. Oh. So if you are interested, you know, Charlotte is, is from the Lithopolis area. And Carolyn is from the, the Bexley area. And right now, we don't know exactly where they're going to be representing because there's a, a wonderful drama that's going there on. Is, in this there area. is no districts. So, yeah. So, yeah. That's but interesting. Was, Travis, yeah. Travis was on earlier and he ran in Bexley. So maybe he and uh, uh, Carolyn can share notes on that. So, uh, okay. I do want to thank you, Mark, for a wonderful job. Hey, that you've done with this i think adrian we don't need to waste time on that thank you though jamie <laughs> adrian and mike were both wonderful okay yes. i'm done michael did you want to say anything uh, at the end and then uh brian brian you thanks for you posting all these things in the chat the uh the bronzeville recognition will be at the lincoln theater on march 3rd okay march 3rd uh i believe around four, do, 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 four, four p.m yeah, four o'clock. Okay, Michael, if you wanted to kick us off with some power. <laughs> hey, real quick, a shout out to Brian Curtis. This guy gets around the city of Columbus. Yeah. He knows all the who's and the how's and what's and the where's. And so, um, and good to even see. Even though you he wears there. blue and blue and maize, I mean that that's okay. But you know, yeah, you know, we lost. Be nice. We <laughs> lost tonight. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Um, I'll just say this. I've said enough about the Rickenbacker house. Uh, keep driving, park in your prayers in all these neighborhoods in the urban city. Um, we're fluctuating. We're all trying to figure it out. Keep our heads above water. Keep the history tight. You know, no one wants to lose a community that they've called home for 50 years, 60 years, you know. And uh, we all want to see things improve, but you know, we need to take care of the people who have been here, but we also need to be aware and to take care of those who are coming. And I'm talking about the less, those who have less than. Um, 
I don't want us to be like that Senator Byrd guy who gets to choose his neighbors, okay? And so let's stick together in love. Everyone plays a role. Everyone has a role to play. Play your part in life, in community, and stay active and keep your heads up. That's it. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Thank you. That That's a way to kick us out with good spirits. Um, Yes, we do have some victories that we need to celebrate. The Ohio Supreme Court kicked the the, the unfair districts out, uh, but they only have until Thursday, this Thursday, uh, coming up to, to, to make some kind of new map. I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, Suzanne, uh, Stephen, thank you for everything that you guys do. Brian, do you have anything last minute? I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't. I didn't know you'd lost tonight. I, I knew they were playing, but I didn't know it had it had gone yeah. down that way. That's the last two games then, huh? 